this is the world of Oath. We have the map in the middle here. We have our own player boards around the table. We got dice. We got some other things. So I'll go into the specific terminology first so that you know what I'm talking about. If you look in the top right, we have a favor supply and a secret supply. These little blue books are called secrets. Sometimes they're face up, sometimes they'll be face down. Everybody starts with one of those. So feel free to grab one and put it on your player board. We also have these little coins, which are called favor. They they can be face up or face down, but it doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, doesn't change anything about them. And you guys each start with one. I start with two favor. Then uh, the next thing to mention would be you have a pawn which this is my guy starts on the top cradle site you each have one of your own color and they're going to be on the map to show where your actual character is hanging out war bands you have a little bag next to your board in your color and in that are your war bands we each start with three and you keep those on your board. The ones on your board versus the ones that are in your bag is important, so try not to get them mixed up. I'll explain the map next. So the map here is split up into three regions, Cradle, Provinces, and Hinterland. And each one has multiple sites, which are these big cards. Two in the Cradle, three in the other two. Some of them are face down. That means no one has been there yet. Some of them are face up. Those are ones that have already been discovered in previous Chronicles. Uh, there's also a discard pile in each region, and as you notice, the discard piles are face down. When you discard cards, they don't get revealed, they stay face down because you can actually draw from them instead of from the main deck. So that's one little weird thing about Oath specifically. Uh, you'll also notice up top, there's a little iconography for how much it costs to travel, how much it costs to seek. I'll explain those in a little bit when I get to actions, but that's effectively what's that saying. Uh, each site can also have denizen cards, which are the ones lined up with them like that. Each site in the top right shows how many denizen cards can fit their max, so the hidden place can have two cards, or it has one, so there's only room for one more. Narrow pass can only have one, so it's already filled up with this edifice. We also have relics which are face down, and you can get those by paying the cost in the bottom right, which I'll explain a little more when I get to the recover action. And each site has a special little ability that I'll go into a little more detail in a little bit. Down here, the banks. These are each suit starts with three favor, and you will be getting that as you play cards of those suits throughout the rest of the game. Uh, we also have the round marker. It can go a max of eight rounds, so every time we I'll take a turn, we're going to scoot that ahead, and I can only win as the Chancellor, I will start as Oath Keeper, and if I'm Oath Keeper at the end of the fifth round and on, uh, that's my only chance to win. I can't win any earlier, but I'll explain that a little more when we get there. We also have the Visions Drawn track, which uh, keeps track of how many visions we draw. This, on top of the deck, you can see is a vision. It's got the eye there versus the Denison cards, which have the group of people on it. Every time we draw a vision, it goes across, and it will increase how much it costs to draw from the world deck. Uh, we also have the relics deck, which if we flip over something that has a relic, we'll drop a relic into that area, face down. That's about everything for the map, so I'm going to zoom in a bit and talk about the player boards. I'm looking at yellow, but they're all of the XL boards are identical aside from the artwork and the color. You have three phases on your turn. Wake. All wake is is checking if you win, basically. As an exile, you can win either as being the... If you uh, are the Oath Keeper in your wake phase, if you're the Oath Keeper, you flip it over and you become Usurper. And then if you're still Usurper in your next wake phase, you win. So you check for that. Some of your cards will say uh, wake colon, and that's what happens in the wake phase as well. Uh, the people's favor, you have to do some stuff with that in the wake phase, but I'll get into that a little later if it comes into play. Then after you do all of your wake stuff, 
you do your act phase. When you do anything in the action phase, generally, you're going to be using supply, which is this little marker on the bottom of the board. Every time you spend a supply, you move it to the right. So that's one supply, two supply, three supply, etc. And you can go all the way to the end. Um, any supply that you don't use by the end of your turn. So once you end your act phase, if you have any left, you bank it. So you zip back up plus that much. So effectively, uh, I'll get into that when I get to rest, but you can save. Um, you can save supply effectively. So the different actions we have, top to bottom search, which is a little telescope, uh, costs a different amount depending on where you're going. If you're drawing from a discard pile in your region, which is wherever your pawn is currently, then you just draw three cards, costs you two supply. If you draw from the world deck, uh, you're going to do it one by one. If you hit a vision, which would mean just one card here, then you uh, will stop, increase the vision's drawn track. And how much it costs is based on where that's at. So if one to two visions have been drawn, it'll cost you three. Uh, three or more, it'll cost you four. At the beginning, it only costs you two. When you search, you draw your cards, you pick one to keep, and you discard two. When you discard them, you discard out one. So if I was to do it because I'm in the cradle, I would discard my two cards face down into the provinces discard. If it was in the provinces, it'd go to the hinterlands. And if it was the hinterlands, it wraps around to the cradle. Um, the one that you pick, you can either put to your site if there's space. So if I had it, I could put it right there. And if I do that, then I get one uh, favor from that bank. If there's any left. If it's empty, you don't get it. But you get a free favor from the bank of whatever card you play there. However, some of them you can't. So if you notice here on Wayside Inn, there's a little tree underneath the hearth in the top left. That means that it can only be played to a site. If that was a little person symbol, which I unfortunately don't have any to show as example, but if that was a person, it could only be played to your advisors, which your advisors is pretty much your, your hand of cards. You can play face down if you want to hide something for later, or you can play it face up and be able to use it right away. You don't get any favor for playing to your advisors, but you are the only one who gets to use any of your advisors. And like I said, if it has the person icon, it has to go there, can't go to a site. Uh, if it has a chain, that means it cannot be discarded. So, like, this, the Sprawling Rampart, which is an edifice, has a chain, so it cannot be discarded in any normal way. Unless something specifically says remove that, uh, you cannot remove it. So, right. If you play face down to the advisors, you can flip it up later for free. It won't cost you any supply, but that's basically just a way to hang on to it. And if it's a tree that could only be played to a site, you can play it face down to your advisors, but once you flip it up, it has to go to whatever site your pawn is at at that time. Uh, so that's pretty much search. Next up is muster. Muster is how you get more warbands, because you can only really use the ones that are on your board for campaigning, which is attacking. So to muster, you just place one favor from your board onto a denison card at your site. And in most cases, you can only place one thing on here. It can be a secret or a favor, but if it already has a secret or a favor on it, you can't put anything more on it. So just keep that in mind when mustering. But you spend one favor onto that card, and you get two war bands from your bag onto your board. Trading is a, a good way to get favor and secrets. Effectively, you put either a secret on a card at your site and you get favor or you put favor on there and you get secrets so if you want to trade you put uh, either one secret on any of the cards at your site that doesn't have one already and you get one favor from that card's bank so obviously you wouldn't want to do it for an empty bank but that's an easy way to get it and you get one additional favor for each of that suit you have face up in your advisors. So if you traded with second chance and you had one or two beast advisors, you get one or two more favor. So one for the one you're trading to plus one for each in your advisors. If you wanted secrets, you would put two favor on 
a denizen at the site your pawn is at. However, you don't get a secret for the one that you put it on. You only get one secret for each of your face-up advisors that matches. So if you tried to trade for secrets at second chance and you didn't have a beast advisor, then you wouldn't get anything. You have to have at least one beast one, but for each face-up one that matches, you get a secret. So if you had three face-up beasts and you trade with that, you get three secrets. So that costs two to do it that way. Uh, and that is one supply. I forgot to mention, muster and trade are always going to be one supply. Recover is how you get relics and how you get the banners. Uh, I'll explain the banners later. If they come into play, they don't always, and they're a little complicated. But if you want to know during gameplay, feel free to ask. Um, so to recover, you spend a supply, and then you pay what you need to. So in the case of relics... It's whatever's in the bottom right. If you wanted to get the relic at the hidden place, you'd have to have your pawn there. You do the recover action, and then you burn one secret. That means you take it off your board, and you put it back into the main supply. You just lose that secret. It's out of the game. Um, for this one, you would put three favor from your board into the arcane bank. So it's three favor, two arcane is what that says. Um, let's see. There's also, if you see a broken coin, that means you burn that favor. It doesn't go to a bank. It goes into the supply. And if it's just a plain book like this, that just means you put the secret on there. If it's not your turn, you just flip the secret. You don't put it onto there for reasons that I'll explain in the rest phase. So travel is to move from one site to another. If you look at the legend at the top of each region it tells you how much it costs. So this little sort of refresh circular arrow, that's to move to another site in the same region. So it would cost one supply for me to move to the narrow pass. It would cost, if you look at the arrow, that's how far you're gonna move to the right. So if I want to move to any of the sites in the provinces, it would cost me two to do, move the one arrow. If I want to move to any of the sites in the hinterland, it would be four. That's the two arrows going all the way. And if you look, it's the reverse over here. So if I want to move two over to the cradle, it'd be four. It would cost three to move between the hinterland, etc. Um, if you move to a face down site, you're allowed to move to a face down site. It just flips and you go right over there. And if there are any relics that need to be put there, we'll pull one from the deck and put it face down next to that. The, the big thing to pay attention to is these site powers, which there's quite a few. And if you look in the top right here, there is a reference that explains what each of those icons mean. But to quickly go over these ones, the hidden place, if you look, it's a travel boot and a campaign boot costs one secret. So you got to flip one secret on your board face down. And it's like tapping in magic. It's basically saying, I used it this turn. I can't uh, use it again this same turn. But you don't lose it, it's just showing that you used it. So you have to do that to travel to the hidden place or campaign at the hidden place. Uh, narrow pass, if you move into the cradle, you have to move into the narrow pass first. You can't go to the hidden place uh, without going to the narrow pass first. So it'll cost you effectively at least three to move over there and move over there. Charming Valley, that one's pretty simple. It costs one more supply to move out of the Charming Valley. It's so charming you don't want to leave, so you got to spend an extra supply. Shrouded Wood, it costs only two to move into the Shrouded Wood. That's it. No matter where you're moving from, it only costs two, which, unfortunately, it being in the provinces doesn't matter that much because it would have only cost two anyways. Uh, Great Slum, all that means is that if you do a, a search action and you want to play to there, you can discard one of these cards first. Normally, you cannot discard any of those cards uh unless it's the Great Slum or you have the People's Favor, which gives you a special ability. Lush Coast, if there is another coast site that has this symbol, it only costs one to travel between them. So even if there was one here and one over here, it would only cost one supply to move between those two. Campaign. All right, I saved it for last. It's not... It's a little complicated, and I'll probably have to help you guys a little bit. What? Shrouded Wood is two to move out of. Are you sure? I'm checking that. Hold on. Yeah, it's... It's 
two to move out of, and whoever rules it can decide oh, where you go. Oh, okay, you also okay. ignore narrow pass. So, yes, I got that backwards. Thank you. <laughs> shrouded wood, it is two to move out of the shrouded wood to anywhere, and it allows you to ignore the narrow pass. So you could just go from there to the hidden place, and you wouldn't. it also ignores the hidden place, so you wouldn't have to spend a secret to move there from there to the hidden place. Um... Yeah, like I said, the reference is up there if you're confused about any of those, and feel free to ask questions at any point during this game. So, campaign. To campaign, you are going to basically put your pawn into a place that you want to target, and you get to choose what you target. Anything that has a blue die in the corner, like this, can be targeted. So it can be that. You can just... uh do the player's pawn, at which point they get the dice in the corner of their player board. You can do a relic, so this one would add like five blue dices, but you have to do at least one thing at your site. So if someone else's pawn is there, you have to attack their pawn or their relic. Uh, if you want to take control of a site, which in this game to win, you have to control the most sites, rule the most sites. Um, so to do that, you would have to attack the site to take it. Once you attack one thing at your site, you can attack as many other things that are ruled by the person who is there that have the blue dice. So if you attacked me um, and I ruled multiple sites, you can attack all of those sites. You only have to be at one to attack all of them. But for every place that you pick, everything that you pick, relic, site, whatever, mix and match... Uh, I will get the dice that are in the corner. So let's say you wanted to attack the hidden place to take it away from me and the Grand Scepter. That would mean that I get the one die in the corner and the five dice over here. So that would mean that I get six blue dice that I'm going to get to roll. The dice, uh, I will explain in a minute when I roll them. Then, once you have decided all of that, you will decide how many attack dice you want to do. The attack dice, you can roll up to the number of warbands you have on your board. So uh, if you only have three, you can do up to three. But you don't have to do them all. You can do one, two, whatever. You can do up to that amount as long as you roll at least one. Um, then, once you have decided how many dice, you will get to use battle plans. Let me move these dice down here in my teaching arena. Okay, so battle plans look like this. They will have the campaign symbol and most of them will have a crown on it, which means that it is the place that you rule. So if you rule the lush coast, you can use this and you just say, I'm using it and you'll gain one supply. Um, there are other ones that add or subtract dice. So it'll say plus you know, re uh, plus orange dice, minus orange dice, plus blue dice, minus blue dice. And it just to, if it's plus and minus, it's just whichever makes sense for you. So if you're attacking and you activate one that's plus or minus attack dice, then it's going to be adding the attack dice because that's helping you. If you're defending and it's plus or minus, then it's going to be minus because that helps you. And you add all of the battle plans that you rule that you want. And so you rule all the ones at sites that you rule. And you rule all of the ones in your advisors. Uh, if it has, you know, a coin on it or a book, then you have to put the secret or the favor on there um, to activate it. Then once we've done all that, we we selected our dice. Uh, we use the battle plans to add and subtract dice and do other things. So once we've done all of that, we roll and what we roll is going to determine who wins. So I'll just do a roll random. We'll say it was 6 versus 10. Okay. On the blue dice, we have two blank sides, uh, two single shields, one double shield, and one times two. So you add up all of the shields, which in this case, that's uh, six and then you multiply it. So six times two. If this was a times two, it'd be six times two, 12. 
times 2 again, 24. It's exponential. It just keeps adding up. So that's why the more dice there are, the worse it could be for you as the attacker. Hence why you don't necessarily want to go for a ton of targets at once. On the opposite side, we have the attack dice, which have single sword, hollow swords, and double sword and skull. There's only one of these sides on each one. How that uh, works is for every skull, you immediately lose one warband from your board. Hence why you might not necessarily want to use all of them because all of them have the chance of killing off one of your warbands. Then you add up all the swords. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus every pair of these hollow swords. So that was eight, nine for this pair, and 10 for this pair. We ignore any remainders. So this one, he doesn't do anything for us. Then for the defense roll, we add any warbands. So if you attacked sites, then any warbands at those sites get added. So if I had like two here, that would add two defense. And if you're attacking the site with the pawn or, you know, like the relic, because you have to attack at the site with the pawn to attack the relic, uh, then any that are on the board also get added. So that add three if I was defending. Then once we have those, you have to get at least one more to win. So if you tie, that's no good. So if you are still behind as attacker, you can sacrifice warbands from your board. One, each one you sacrifice adds one. So basically you have to sacrifice enough to get it to be one more attack with the roll than them to win. If you don't, you don't have to sacrifice anything, but you lose. And whoever loses, loses half of their force. That is half of the warbands involved. If it involved your pawn, the ones on your board, and any ones at sites that were targeted, and so it's half rounding down. If there's like five, you only lose two. The rest of them go back to your board. And then whoever won, um, if the attacker won, that is, and they knocked off the guy's sights, then you get to put any of the warbands from your board onto the sights you just won. And if you don't, that's fine. You don't have to, but you don't rule it because any empty site is ruled by bandits, which if you look just under the die icon, there's a little printed warband that's the bandits. So they always get one die plus one. And if there are any free battle plans, they're going to use them at the site you targeted. So if you want to take an untaken site, you have to fight them. They're pushovers. It's not too hard. So that's campaigning. I, I know it's a little confusing. I will definitely run through it when we do it to make sure that there's no problems. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the general idea. Then that's all everything that costs supply. We also have minor actions, which are free. You can do these all you want on your turn for free, but you can only do them during your act phase on your turn. So the options are play your discard a face down advisor. So if you have a face down advisor that you haven't flipped over yet, you can flip it over to play it immediately, which if there's like a when played, you get it. If it has something that you got to put on it, like a favor, you just put it on there. A lot of them will change... Uh, different stuff. So like if you look at Old Oak right here, he has an icon for trade. So anytime you trade, if it's he's uh, at the site that your pawn is at and you do what it says, then you get that benefit. Or Tense. So Tense has a boot, which is travel. So when you travel, if you pay it that one, you can do what it says. And then, yeah, there will be ones in your... Like Tense wouldn't have to be played out to a site if you had gotten that... In your hand, you can put it in your advisors and be the only one who gets to use it. Um, so you can flip them face up on your turn. All you want to do that. Uh, you can't flip them back face down. Uh, if they're still face down, you can discard them to make space. And if you're doing a search action, you can discard any face down or unchained advisors. If it has a chain, unfortunately, you can't discard it unless you get something that specifically says you can. But if it's face down or it doesn't have a chain you can to make space because you only get up to three advisors total. There's a couple cards in there that'll like change that. Some of them bring it down to two. Some of it pops it up to four, but generally three advisors max. Um, you can also use action cards. So any action cards that are in your advisors face up, 
or any action cards that are at the site you're at. So like second chance, that's an action. So you just put a secret on it and then you get to do what it says in the action. That's free. You don't have to spend any supply. You just got to put the secret on it. Um, you also get to peek at relics at your site. So if you're at a site with a relic, you can look at it, which if you don't know how, you just hover over it, push alt, and then hold shift, and it will show it to you. And if you've already looked at a relic and you move, you're allowed to look at it again because you've already seen it. So that's, that's fine if you need to remind yourself, you know, you just can't look at one that is at a site you haven't traveled to yet. And that is also free. Uh, the other minor action is you can move warbands from your board to the site or back. So if your pawn is at a site that you rule that has warbands, then you can move any of them from your board onto the site, any of them from the site onto your board. You just have to leave one at the site. You can't take all of them. You can take all but one, but yeah, that's how you can move your force around uh, more manually. So those are all of the major actions. Then, end of your turn, you go into rest after you do all your actions. And remember, you can do, you know, as many as you have supply for. You can do all the minor actions you like that you have the different resources for. At the end of your turn, you're going to rest. And let's say you're here, yellow. So, look at yellow's board for this example. So, first thing you do is any cards that have a favor on it because you mustered or you traded or you used an action like this one those go to the bank of that suit so if you had done this one you take that favor and you put it on the hearth suit any secrets that got put out and not burned get brought back to your board you get your secrets back so they're basically a renewable resource uh, any that are flipped face down flip right back face up um which it doesn't happen until your rest. So if you flip it face down to use a battle plan and your advisors on someone else's campaign, say, you're not going to be able to use that secret on your own turn. So once you've cleaned up all of that, you refresh your supply. So what you do is you check how many warbands you have left, which in this case, yellow has 14. So you go to 9 plus. 14 is more than 9. Then because you didn't use all of your supply, you still had one less, you go to 9. And then you go one more and you max out. Um, if you had less than that, you know, if you had like six, you'd go eight to four and then you'd still bank one like that. So you, you can save it turn to turn, but, you know, you can still only max out at seven supply. So don't save too much. All right. That that is pretty much it. Let's see. Uh, right. Win conditions. The win condition in this game, and that it changes by game, is Oathkeeper of Supremacy. Whoever has the Oathkeeper and does that can win. So it's rule the most sites. In this case, I start with warbands on every site that has a Denison card. Two on the topmost cradle site, and then one on the rest. So the Chancellor always starts as Oathkeeper. So whatever the specific criteria is, the Chancellor will start as that at the beginning of the game. So I rule the most sites. Uh, yes, I did that correctly. And then uh, the successor, that's citizenship. I'll explain that if I actually offer citizenship because it's a little complicated. Um, let's see. And then you guys, so your options are get the Oath Keeper and keep it for two turns to become Usurper and then win on your next wake phase. Or Visions. Visions, if you played... Uh, root are basically like dominance cards. If you get it and you fulfill it, then you win at the beginning of your next turn. And they're all basically a simulacra of the different oaths. So there's one in there that's Oathkeeper of Supremacy, where you rule the most sites. And the reason you'd want to do it is because it only takes one turn to win. If you get Oathkeeper, you got to go two turns. If you use a vision, you win on the next turn as long as you hang on to whatever it is. Uh, you can also only win if you have at least three visions drawn. So it's you have to fulfill what it says, and there needs to be three visions drawn from the deck. Uh, you can reveal whatever vision, or you can keep it face down. And if you have a revealed vision, 
I believe you can replace that revealed vision with another revealed vision, correct? Discard yeah, the... you, okay. you can replace your vision if you draw another one. Right. Okay, okay. So yeah, visions are pretty much only for you guys. There's another one in there called The Conspiracy that's a false vision, and it basically lets you steal... Um, it lets you steal a relic or a banner, but it, it'll say on there all the different stuff on it. Uh, we also have the rule book out here in case you want to see that. And like I said, there's a reference up here. It explains the conspiracy, explains the cards, a uh, summary of how the campaigns work and the sites and all that. So with all of that said, let's see. Uh, yellow, you still need to start with your three war bands. So I'll just get and grab those for you. That is how it starts. Chancellor always starts. Does anyone have any questions before we start the first turn? If you uh, attack... So say uh, I wanted to attack the Great Slum. Mm -hmm. Would you get a defense dice for... You get this one defense dice here, mm -hmm. a defense dice for the warband that's already on the site. Ah, no, And no. then do you... I don't know. Actually, no, it's you get uh, a defense die for that, and then each warband is plus one to whatever you roll. So you don't get another dice for the warband, you just get an additional defense point after you roll. Okay, uh, okay, I see. Um, but just to also, clarify, when, sorry, when you're attacking, you get a, a die per warband that you have. Yes. On defense, you get a die per die like the one at the site yes. or the one on your board. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. That's that's correct. It's when you're defending, it's based on whatever is being targeted. So one per site or whatever it shows on a relic if you're attacking their relic. Um, or if you're attacking their pawn, it's the two in the corner of your board. Uh, and then, yes, uh, when you attack, it's up to however many warbands you have. But remember, each die could kill off a warband, so... You got to kind of risk assess how many you actually want to risk while still getting enough to actually get the high roll. And one last thing, whoever has Oathkeeper, they get plus one defense die whenever they're campaigned against. And on the flip side, Usurper, which you guys only get, I never get Usurper. But just as an example, if you're Usurper, you get two extra defense die when somebody campaigns against you. One last thing. Right. Uh, you have been dealt uh, three cards as if a search action. So to start off, you pick one to put face down in your advisors, and then the other two you will discard out. So right now, pick a card you want to keep, and then pick where your pawn's going to be, because that's going to determine where you discard your other two cards to. And your pawn can start on any face-up site. Uh, we do need to do it in turn order for discarding purposes. Uh, yes. We have the two banners, the banner of the Darkest Secret and the banner of the People's Favor, often just abbreviated to the Darkest Secret, People's Favor. And you can, instead of recovering a relic, you can use a recover action to get one of these banners. If you want the People's Favor, you just have to put more favor on it than there currently is. It starts out with one, so just two or more favor. It's your choice. And you spend the one supply to recover, and then you get that. And what it lets you do is when searching, uh, you can discard a Denison card from any site in your region and then play the card there. So it means that you can be playing cards to any site in your region that has space and getting a favor for it, or uh, if there's no space, just get rid of one you don't like and replace it. So that's very useful. Um, when you have it, every time it's the beginning of your wake phase so the start of your turn you got to put one more favor on it or take a favor off if there's more than one there has to be a minimum of one uh if by after doing that you've put the sixth one on it flips to the mob side which the mob side is pretty much the same same powers and everything but at the beginning of your turn you have to put a favor on it twice so basically you can put a favor and then take one off but you can't do both. Um, if you recover it, 
you do have to put more so it's not just adding one to the one that's there. So you'd put two, and then the one that's on there, you put in any favorite bank you like. If there's more than one that is on there when you recover it, you put in whatever favorite bank you like, and then you go to the right, putting one in each. So if you put it in Discord, then you put one in Arcane, then that, and it loops back around at the end. Um, so that's the people's favor, which is one of the victory conditions, and it's one of the visions. The darkest secret, similarly, you have to put... Uh, sorry, hmm? sorry, just to clarify, uh, when you discard the coins, you actually have to start with whatever favor bank has the least amount of favor. Well, no, 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 close. But uh, it's if you put it off of the thing at the beginning of your turn, then you put in the lease. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. you are right. You get to pick when you're doing it from times. after recovering. But then, yeah, at the beginning of your turn, if you decide to take it off, you put it in whatever has the least. Gotcha. Favor. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. No worries. Uh, the darkest secret. Similarly, you just put more secrets on it than it already has. So in this case, two or more. Um, in this case, instead of going to favor banks, you get one of the secrets that was already on it. So in this case, you get one secret back and then any that are left go to whoever had it last. So if there was two on here, you'd get one. Whoever had it would get one. If there was three, they'd get two. You'd get one and so on. Uh, what this allows is that no matter what the vision drawn tracker mark is, uh, it's two supply to check the world deck. So you don't have to worry about a bunch of visions while you have the darkest secret um, you don't have to add to this one but if you'd like to to keep it safe because however many favor or secrets is on these is how many defense dice you'll get if someone targets it because they can target it in a campaign but you get one defense dice per the things on it The other thing is, in this case, because no player has it, you can just get it with a recover action. If a player has it, you can only get it if they're at a site where there is a card with a suit that does not match any of their advisors. So if I had it and I was at the hidden place, there is a hearth there. I don't have a hearth advisor, so you could take it. But if I was at uh, the Lush Coast... You couldn't take it because I have an order advisor. There's none there that don't match. Or if I was at the planes, there's nothing there. So there's nothing there that doesn't match. So that's something to keep in mind if you want a gun for that. Or if you want to protect it is to stay at a site that matches your advisors of one. There's always going to be at least one on there. Yellow. We're going we're gonna to offer you citizenship here. So how it works is um, I offer you at least one relic from the Imperial Reliquary up here. And I can okay. offer you other things. So in this case, I will offer you one of these. Uh, let me let me check what they are to see which one I want to offer you. Okay, I will offer you this one or that one. You get to choose one. And you're allowed to peek at them because I said so. And I will give you this one secret I just got so that you can get some stuff. Now, if you do that, you become part of the Empire, and you flip your board over, so you can't win by a vision anymore, but you can become successor. And how you become successor is fulfilling the, the purple role here. So in this case, if you have more relics and banners than me, and I win, then actually you win. So it basically just means you got one, one victory condition. You get me to win while holding the most relics and banners in this case. And you also switch to a shared supply of warbands with the uh, Thank you. The yes, I forgot. Yes, you'll start using my warbands instead. So you'll take your four back, and then you'll take four of them from my supply. Um, and then the ones on your board you'll also take from my bag. And instead, right. instead of refreshing uh, based on your warbands, you'll refresh based on where I refresh to. So in okay. this case, if we do that, I will only refresh to here, and we'll both have only the three unfortunately so 
Offering um, citizenship is usually a net negative for the chancellor. Like, yeah, it's true. he really has no other options to, to try to keep the game going than to pretty much have because you're there. Uh, mm -hmm. So, just as a kind of a, str a strategy standpoint, um, it gives you a different win condition, but it's also going to, you can also start draining him of his resources yeah. very quickly. And keep in mind, keep in mind, so I have one relic, the Grand Scepter. If I give you a relic, which I'm about to, if you accept, and you were able to take the banner away from white, which will need to keep him from winning, then that means you will have two versus my one, and you will already be fulfilling the successor uh, thing. If I am Oathkeeper at the end of round five or later, we roll the purple die right over... Where'd it go? I got it. There it's it on, is. I put it in the so we'd roll this, and if it is equal to or higher than whatever the number is, and I am Oathkeeper, that means that I will win. Uh, so if I'm Oathkeeper at end of round five, I need to roll a six. And around six, it has to be a five or a six. And of round seven, it has to be a three or higher. And at the end of round eight, if I am the Oathkeeper, then I just win outright. It never goes past round eight. So at the moment, we can't take the dark secret from him because he's at a site with um, denizens that match his advisor, correct? Uh, let's see. Yes. No, well, we can uh, actually Denizen. because he doesn't have a hearth. There only needs to be one card at the site that doesn't mm, match his advisors. Okay. So uh, it is grabbable, uh, but we need at least five <laughs> secrets. Or we can and, campaign. And if I accept citizenship, all the warbands, my warbands, become purple? Yes. Which uh, would also I, did, I good. didn't know that there was had to be every single matching one. Okay. And I can use any of the denizens that we control. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Once look, you're a part of the location. Empire, you also control all the sites on your turn. And you're still allowed to campaign against me. It's not super advisable because I get a lot mm -hmm. of uh, say in how you do it. Um, but what I'd recommend is if you take this, it's going to be difficult to get the five. So I'd say ig ignore whether or not he's at the suits. Just j pull up some of your um, war bands from that site move to another site that has some of my war bands. I'll let you pull those up too, and then campaign against him. Uh, okay. To campaign um, against I, I'm going to accept this. He, he would have to be at his pawn, wouldn't he? Yeah. So what and I'm I'll saying take, uh, is like you pull up these guys, move to the Shrouded Wood, pull up a couple of those guys, then move back, which only costs two, and I will say that you can go to the Great Slums, and then uh, campaign. In fact, uh, I don't think you'll be able to muster because then the purple bag will be empty. I, I have a plan, um, but I'll accept citizenship. All right. So which relic do you want to take? Uh, the far one. All right. One. Take it and flip it over. And the other thing is because you unveiled it, I now have this greedy condition. So I draw uh, five cards, but I cannot draw from the world deck. And you have the Oracular Pick now, which is just a free action to peek at the top three cards of the world deck on your uh, during your action phase. And then right. uh, and next, then... because you accept a citizenship, just click that button. There you go. You're a citizen now. So yeah, we're going to... Oh, and you refresh your supply all the way to the left as a citizen. Put these four guys back in your bag. I'll give Not you four of my guys. Well. All right. So these guys on your board. And then these guys, guys at your site. 